Greetings everyone and welcome to a special edition of Faith Time. Yes, today you see me differently. I'm standing up. I'm in a different mood. Why? Because today is the Sabbath of the Lord and we want to do something special this evening. We're not doing the usual. We are taking this time Friday night to have a special moment with the Lord. It will be a very simple service, but I'm greeting all of you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hoping that you had a blessed Friday and expecting this to be a truly happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for being there. I'm Pastor Reynolds Rodriguez, pastor of Genesee Park and Sandy Creek Churches here in the greater Rochester area. And we praise God for his blessings and I praise God for his mercy towards me since he has allowed me to be with you tonight once more and also to be in your churches. So tonight is night number six. We're planning to go through eight nights, and we have a special guest. It's Pastor Zachariah Musselman from our conference here. He's in the area of Jamestown, southwest of the state. That's the last corner of the state heading west and the last district heading into that direction here at the New York Conference. But he's a man of God, and he's ready to bless us tonight in this program that we have decided to entitle Step of Faith. Step of 
faith. So thank you so much for being there. I'm greeting all of you that are starting to say hi and connecting on the comment section. Please go ahead, type your name. Let us know where you're writing for for us to receive the Sabbath together tonight. That's what we want to do. I'm not going to be speaking for a long time or anything like that. We want to keep it simple so you can spend time with your family tonight receiving the Sabbath of the Lord. Meaning at the end of this service, at the end of tonight's service, we want you to take your family or take yourself if you live alone like me and pray, sing, receive the Sabbath of the Lord, have a special food or crackers or snack or something, but make it special. If you're just with your husband or, or, or your wife, I hope you're going to get ready to have a good time in the Lord together tonight because faith time also has to do with you doing things on the Sabbath to honor God. So this is Friday, our sixth night of the Faith Time series, and we are so excited that you're with us tonight and ready to receive the Word of God. I was the speaker the first four nights from Sunday to Wednesday. Then last night we had Pastor Christopher Lockhart with us. He spoke about his faith and not ours. And then tomorrow night he will return to be with us and Sunday night as well. But tonight we have Pastor Zach Musselman with us ready to deliver the Word of God. And in order to do that, as we typically do, I am inviting you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your love. And thank you for the Sabbath that is about to begin. I uplift your name, Lord, because there is no one good here on this planet. You are a good Father, and we honor you tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead our spirits to connect to your spirit tonight as we get together for one more time one more opportunity to have some faith time with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. I have my Bible ready right here, and I hope you're getting yours, as I would like to share with you something interesting from the Word of God. But right now, the invitation is for you to click on share right there. We are live streaming through Facebook in our series Faith Time, so please go ahead and share it. Click on the share button, just share it on your profile, text messages, messenger, WhatsApp, do whatever you have to do, but invite everyone to be connected with us. Let us expand, as I say, each night, the number of people that are connected because we want them also to enjoy what the Lord has prepared for you. I would like to read from the prophet Isaiah tonight, the book of the prophet Isaiah, and we're going to turn to chapter 56. Isaiah, the 56th chapter, and we'll read from verse 4, a very interesting verse and promise that we see from the Lord here. Isaiah 56 from verse 4, it says, For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. But you may be saying, well, that's for, for the eunuchs and the Hebrews, that's not for me. How about for those that are not Hebrews? We're also supposed to keep the Sabbath. So if you're not a Jew, the Bible here will tell you really clearly that as creatures of the Lord, even though by bloodline we do not belong to the Israelites, we belong to God, and God says the following, beginning on verse 6. So you can see that from ancient times, the Sabbath was dedicated to all humans. It reads the following way. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. So the Lord is saying here, the foreigner, meaning those that are not Israelites or Jews or Hebrews, you're supposed to join the Hebrews, join the Jews in praising God, join me in my, in, in the, in my holy day of rest. But before we do that, he says, I'm asking you to love me. So that's why he says in Exodus 20, 
And also in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then he says, if you, know, if you now love the name of the Lord, and I know that if you're there, you love the name of the Lord. And if also you have become his servant, he's saying, do not defile my Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. So foreigners and Jews were called and have been called to keep the Sabbath. Hence why we're keeping the Sabbath from sunset to sunset as it was established in creation and also in Leviticus chapter 23. And right now, I'm telling you, the Sabbath is a blessing because it has an eternal promise attached to it. What is that eternal promise? Verse 7. Even them... I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So there's an everlasting promise to those that are foreigners and keep the Sabbath just like me. He says, I will bring you to my holy mountain. I'll bring you to the mountain of God. I'll bring you to the new Jerusalem. And right there you'll be forever in my house. And then it says that he will accept everything we do for his house should be called or shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. That is why tonight we keep the Sabbath. That is why I read what I just read with you. And right now I'm going to sing a hymn. I want you to enjoy this one. I want you to look for it on the internet. Or if you have the opportunity to have the hymnal at home, awesome. Or if you, or if you have the hymnal app in your uh, smartphone or tablet, I'm inviting you to look for it. I have mine right here. So I'm inviting you now to go to hymn number 381. 381, so we can sing together this hymn entitled, Holy Sabbath, Day of Rest. Number 381, Holy Sabbath, Day of Rest. Three hundred and eighty-one, as we receive the Sabbath together tonight. Holy Sabbath, Day of Rest. By our Master, richly blessed, God created and divine, set aside for holy time. Yes, the holy Sabbath rest by our God divinely blessed. He the shine shall be throughout all eternity. Seek not pleasures of this earth with its folly, noise, and mirth. There are better things in store. Yes, the Holy Sabbath rest by our God divinely blessed. He to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. As the Sabbath throweth on, Friday Eve at set of sun, Christian household then should meet, sing and pray at Jesus' feet. Yes, the Holy Sabbath rest by our God divinely blessed. He to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. Fourth stanza now. Asking Him for saving grace, also victory in the race. 
us by his power to keep holy every eye. Yes, the holy Sabbath. Yes, the holy Sabbath rest by our God divinely blessed. He to us a sign shall be throughout all eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, we are going... After we have sang, I'm going to give an introduction to Pastor Zachariah Musselman, who's ready to deliver the Word of God. But before that, I want you to do something. Tonight, I'm not going to be reading any requests. I'm not going to be choosing any three names to pray for. I'm going to have a special prayer for this COVID-19 crisis that today has claimed the life of more than 50,000 people since it started here in the U.S. 50,000 dead because of the coronavirus. I want to pray for the nurses and doctors, for those that are sick, for the families of those that have failed as victims to it, and also for protection for those that are still here, meaning you and I. However, I have a challenge for you. I want you now to say in the comment section below, or to your side, I need prayers for this or that. Bring up your prayer requests. But I'm asking the rest of you, I'm asking all of you that are not bringing a prayer request at the time, to choose one of the prayer requests that are presented tonight. So please start typing your prayer request if you have one. And then I'm asking the rest to choose one prayer request to pray for, especially for that one. You don't have necessarily to tell the person that you're praying for them. Just pray for them in the privacy of your own space. But if you feel free and if you know the person and you would like to pray with that person, then you can text the person, message the person telling them, I'm praying for you and I'd like to pray for you. I'll repeat again, I'll be having a special word of prayer at this hour, but I'm also asking for those that have requests to bring them up, to type them down, and then I'm asking those that do not have requests, meaning are not typing them down, to choose one of the requests that will be typed, and those that are being typed already, choose one of them and pray in a special way for this request that you've chosen. If you know the person, and if you're willing to communicate to that person, then let that person know that you're praying for them. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at this hour, we want to pray for this COVID-19 crisis. Praying, first of all, for first responders, nurses, and doctors that are facing these cases each day at the hospital level or at any level. Lord, they're risking their lives in order to save others. In the same way, Christ gave his life to save many. And of course, considering the distance from your sacrifice, O oh Jesus, to the sacrifice of these doctors, I want to say that they're sacrificing their families, their health, and all they have in order to save and heal those that are sick. Give them strength. Give them wisdom and protect them, O oh Lord. Be with those that have seen family members dying. Give them comfort and peace. Give them your blessing of consolation tonight. And please comfort their hearts. I'm also asking, Lord, for those that are sick in hospitals or at home. Self-quarantined because they have been di diagnosed with the virus. Give them healing, O Lord, and let your holy hand touch them for salvation, but also for recovery. I'm also praying, Lord, for those that have no symptoms and that have been saved all alone. 
keep us guarded with holy angels that will come straight down from heaven to take care of each one of us. Protect us, O Father, and give us your blessing tonight. And let everything that we're facing be left into your hands as we listen to the word of God delivered by your servant, Pastor Musselman. Let this step of faith be an example for each one of us and let your Holy Spirit be with him as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to you all. And I'm getting ready now to invite Pastor Mosselman to, to, to be with us. Pastor Zachariah Mosselman is originally from the South. He's from Florida, Orlando, Florida. But he went to school in Tennessee in Southern and then decided to accept an invitation to serve here at New York Conference. And for the last four years, he has been serving uh, southwest of us here of Rochester in Jamestown and that area that Jamestown covers. He has four churches. He's married to his wife, Taz, and they have a, a child as well. So I'm welcome.
Many ask, why is God allowing all of this to happen? The truth is, everything that's been happening in the four corners of the earth was already prophesied in the Bible. This is the inevitable fulfillment of Scripture. These are the signs that precede the return of the Lord Jesus. God has always allowed humanity to go through difficult times. But the question is, why? We need to remember that when everything is going well, when the wind is at our back, our tendency is to relax and rely on our own strength. Many imagine that they are self-sufficient. They forget about God and even deride Him. But moments like these show us that we are nothing. In the blink of an eye, an invisible enemy can appear to take the lives of thousands with no regard for social class, race, or status. Where are the powerful ones now? Their money and power can do nothing to stop this virus from spreading. In times like this, we see just how fragile and insignificant we really are. Only in times like these do we stop to reflect and bow before the one true God. It's only in the storms of life, in the toughest of times, when people humble themselves before the Most High and seek His help. The writer of Psalms says, My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. Going through deserts teaches us much more than the comfort of green pastures. How many people have given up on praying but have now started to pray again? How many have been spiritually lazy but are now being shaken awake to restore the relationship with God? How many had drifted away but have come back to God in this crisis? God doesn't always change our situation, but He uses the situation to change us. God is using this time to test the faith of those who serve Him. Many are discovering that they spent their entire lives building their houses on the sand. Now that supernatural faith is needed, they've collapsed after years of not practicing what they were taught. One thing is certain. Whoever builds their lives on the rock will go through storms, yet remain unshaken. Storms come to everyone, but only those who hear and practice the word remain. God won't keep us from being thrown into a lion's den, but he'll close the mouths of the lions. God won't keep us from being thrown into a fiery furnace, but he'll ensure that not even a single hair of our head is burned. Let's have this faith as we go through these times, and in the end, we'll come out stronger. Welcome. I'm so glad to be a part of this time when uh, we can just worship together. And I want to welcome you here and uh, say a happy Sabbath. And I want to thank Pastor Reynolds just for the opportunity to be part of your worship experience this evening. Uh, for those that don't know who I am, I am Pastor Zachariah Muslin. I'm the pastor down in the Jamestown Randolph Brockton and Perrysburg area uh, here in southwestern New York. And I want to thank uh, once again Pastor Reynolds for the opportunity to be able to share what God's placed on my heart about faith. And um, let's have a word of prayer as we get into God's word this evening. Dear Holy Father, Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the time that we can come together to worship. Lord, as we talk about faith and um, what it means to have faith, to step out in faith. Lord, I just ask that you would speak to us this evening. Lord, I want to thank you um, for what you're doing. Lord, we want to lift up those uh, who are sick, either with cancer or COVID-19 or any other illness, Lord. 
We know that our world is plagued with sin. And Lord, it's just a sign that you're coming soon. So Lord, I ask that you would help us to be ready to have faith that you are coming back, to help us to believe in you. Lord, I just ask that you would um, just bless us this evening to speak to us in a powerful way. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. My sermon, or my message this evening, I've titled, A Step of Faith. And it uh, comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 29. So if you have your Bibles, I just want to encourage you to open up uh, to Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 29. And I'm just going to read it here this evening for you. And it says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he, was, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on the water. So Jesus said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, I love stories. That's probably one of my most favorite parts about preaching or listening to sermons are stories. I know that we may have heard this story before in the Bible, but I feel sometimes that we read the Bible stories so many times and we hear them so much that we don't, it doesn't make an impact on our lives like other stories do. And so I want to share a story with you this evening and then we're going to come back to the Word of God. We all know about the Twin Towers, or we've at least heard about the Twin Towers. And on September 11th, we usually remember them and remember what happened on September 11th with the World Trade Center. But this story is one that you may have never heard about before. It's about the beginning of the Twin Towers. They'd spent all night stringing a steel cable across the 130-foot gap between the tops of the two towers. As Wall Street woke up at 7 a.m. on the morning of August 7, 1974, Felipe Petit gave a 45-minute show across the high wire, dancing, jumping, laying down, and taunting the police who tried to coax him down. And a quarter mile below, people stopped in disbelief watching not a tightrope walker, but a dancer. He was doing tricks, bouncing up and down, actually leaping up off the wire into the air. At this time, construction on the World Trade Center's Twin Towers was almost, fish, was almost finished and it was fa facing financial disaster. The building space was still mostly empty and criticism was running high against the billion dollar project. But a 24 year old Frenchman did something illegal that changed public opinion. Surprisingly, the biggest feat wasn't the actual high wire act. That's what I do, Felipe said. That part was easy. He performed spectacular acts like that all the time. The risky part was the feat, the risky part of the feat was how he and his friends snuck into the building and hid out all night and strung the high wire. At 18, Felipe was a street performer in Paris. He had a toothache one day and decided to go to the dentist's office. He there saw an article about the Twin Towers being built in New York. The article had an illustration of the project model form 
And when Felipe saw it, he was captivated by it. He knew what he had to do. So he faked his sneeze, and bending over, he ripped out the page from the magazine. Hiding the page, he ran out of the doctor's office, totally forgetting about his toothache. For six years, Felipe developed this, his plan. In January of 1974, he flew to New York for the first time to examine the towers in person. Up until now, he had only studied models and diagrams and perfected his high-wire skills. It was time to finalize his plan. He snuck into the towers during construction, riding the elevators and running up staircases. On his first trip, it took him more than an hour to get to the rooftop while evading security guards. On his second trip to the top of the towers, he took his friend Jim Moore, a photographer. When Jim heard what Felipe was going to do, he turned white and whispered, you're insane. You're going to kill yourself. Felipe went back to Paris to plan the fulfillment of his wild goal. He collected everything he could, building a huge file with facts about the towers. But soon he discovered that there was only so much preparation he could do in Paris. He had uh, to go to the towers to collect all the necessary information that he needed. So he returned to New York in April and hung out around the towers and performed street juggling acts to make a living. And the people of Manhattan loved it. Meanwhile, at night, he would sneak into the building, posing as a reporter and dodging security guards. As he was taking pictures and drawing access routes, he discovered some scary new information. On windy days, the building swayed so much that it was able to snap a steel cable in half. He also learned that there was a police station in the basement, and he hadn't planned on that obstacle. With all this information, he flew back to Paris for the final preparation. He built a huge scale model of the Trade Center in his room and researched the rigging of the wire that would connect the two buildings. He convinced a friend to put up the money, and finally, in May, he returned to New York for what he called his coup. He kept changing the date for the walk, but he finally fixed on a date, August 7th, 1974. On August 6th, the day before the feat, Felipe and his motley crew of six friends took their forged ID passes, dressed as delivery men, and entered the World Trade Center. Since it was moving in day for some of the major corporations occupying their office on the 82nd floor of the South Tower, dressing as moving people, Felipe and his team blended in. They rode the freight elevator up to the 100, 104th floor of the South Tower, where they delivered their equipment, a disassembled balancing pole, a wire for rigging, 205 feet of one inch braided steel cable, and a bow and arrow. Their inside man escorted two of the team distinguished as businessmen up the North Tower, but it was only 4.30 in the afternoon. So both teams had to hide until it was dark so that they could begin their work. Murphy's law of whatever could go wrong, will go wrong, happened that evening. Felipe and his team encountered several challenges that weren't, weren't in the plan. Across the world in Germany, one team member's wife was concerned that Felipe was going to kill himself. And so she tried to call the New York Police Department to warn them to be on the lookout of anything unusual happening on the roof of the Twin Towers. The second unplanned event was an impromptu party thrown by some of the off-duty construction workers on the roof. Felipe and his friends hid on an eight-inch wide I-beam for hours, waiting for the party to end. Finally, early in the morning, Felipe and his friends picked up the bow and arrow and fired a line from the north tower to the south. The two teams used the cover of darkness during the rest of the night to rig the wire. 
When the first construction crew arrived to work at 7 a.m., Felipe's team wasn't quite finished tightening the cable. Felipe was trying madly to work out problems with the final rigging when one of his team members gave up and quit. But by the time the freight, ele freight elevator rose to 104th floor with a construction crew, the two towers were linked together, something that would never happen again. A little after 7 a.m., while people walked the streets to work, Felipe stepped out on the wire. Police and construction workers rushed to the rooftop. And while Felipe reached the other side of the wire, he said it seemed as if a bunch of arms, octopus-like, were waving around, trying to reach out and grab him. So he made a U-turn and started back. On the other side, more people tried to grab him and pull him off. He yelled, hey, I don't need your help. I haven't finished my act yet. And in his next crossing, he started to show off. He presented the promenade trick, throwing the pole over his shoulder as if it was a pitchfork and taking a casual stroll home after a hard day of working in the fields. Then he saluted the crowd, sat down, laid down, and he even jumped into the air. When he looked at the end of the wire, he noticed that the men reaching out to grab him were in police uniforms. They had a French translator there yelling at him to get off the wire and threatening to send a helicopter or even loosen the wire if he didn't get off of it. But how do you get a guy off a high wire when almost 100,000 people are on the ground are cheering for him? To this day, nobody agrees on how long Felipe was on the cable. Some say he crossed six times, others say eight. Some say he was on the wire for 45 minutes. Some say an hour. But when he was done, Felipe decided he had finished his act, that it was time to give himself up to the police and be arrested. Six years of preparation and it was all over. He had reached his goal. So he walked over to South Tower in the words of Felipe, the octopus grabbed me violently. When arrested, he explained, when I see two oranges, I juggle. When I see two towers, I walk. Felipe immediately became one of the most famous men in the world. His picture appeared on the front pages of most newspapers. He was a hero. And because of the overwhelming outburst of public praise, all formal charges against him were dropped. His only sentence was to perform his wire, high wire act for a group of children in Central Park. The next day, Richard Nixon had to resign from office because of, because of the Watergate cover-up. Before leaving Washington by helicopter, Nixon met the press and said, I wish I had the publicity that Frenchman had. The results of Felipe's new fame were abundant. His phone rang with every offer you can imagine. Publishers wanted him to write a book called How to Walk the Wire in Your Backyard in Five Days. Burger King even offered him $100,000 to dress up as a whopper and walk across 8th Street Avenue to open or excuse me, 8th Avenue, to open a new franchise. He became friends with famous people like Robin Williams, Al Pacino, and Sting. Of the many offers he received, he turned down all of them except one. The Port Authority's free lifetime pass to the observation deck on top of the South Tower. He accepted that offer because it represented who he was and what he wanted to, what he wanted to be remembered for. Years later, he remembered, or excuse me, years later, he returned to the South Tower, where in just 45 minutes, he had captured the attention and love of the entire world. When it was all over, Guy Toolsley of the Port Authority interviewed Felipe. Toulouse asked him, what's the critical moment? Felipe responded, there's that moment when you have one foot on the wire and one foot on the building. You have to take the foot off the building 
and put it on the wire. He said, at that moment, you're out there. You've taken a step of faith. Felipe's dream would have never become a reality if he hadn't taken that step out onto the wire. Six years of preparation came down to that final critical moment. Do you think most people would take that step? Would you be willing to take that step? Think of Felipe's uh, statement. There's a moment when you have to take one foot off, off the building and put it on the wire. Imagine for a moment what it was like for Felipe to leave the security of that building and to step out on the wire. The first step is the hardest. When it comes to our relationship with God, some of us have one foot on the wire, or one, one foot on the building and one foot on the wire. But God wants us to step out in faith and totally depend on him. God doesn't want us to just stand there with one foot on the building saying that we trust him, saying that we have faith. He wants us to take our, our foot off the edge and actually step out in faith, to truly unquestionably put our trust in him. This story reminds me of the story that we read at the beginning. Uh, and it reminds me of many stories in the Bible where people took a step in faith and experienced the power and stability of God. But in each story, there came a moment when God says, come. And they had to take that first step of faith. In the book of Matthew, we have the story of Peter walking on the water. He takes a step of faith. And so let's read it again. Um, and we'll start in just verse 27 through 29. Or excuse me, we'll start in verse 25. It says, Now on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come, out, come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Can you imagine that moment there where Peter is in the boat, he and his companions, there's a storm raging on around them. Everything seems to be in chaos and they see a figure there. And they, they're scared. They don't know what to do. Jesus calls out to them, don't be afraid, for it is I. Right now, Jesus is calling out to us. There's a storm raging on in our lives and in this world. We're scared. Maybe you don't know what to do. Maybe COVID-19 is scaring you. Maybe there's family problems. Maybe you're in a financial crisis. There's a storm raging on in your life. You don't know what to do. You're scared. And Jesus is there. He's walking on the water and he's calling out to you. He's saying, don't be afraid for it is I. He's saying, come. Take a step, climb out, of the com climb out of your comfort zone, climb out of the boat, and put your feet on the water. I can just imagine Peter there as he sees Jesus, as he's heard his voice. He knows that's his Savior. And so he decides to come over the edge of the boat as he's looking at Jesus, I can imagine a million thoughts running through his head. Am I really going to be able to walk on the water? Am I going to sink? What's going to happen to me? But then he looks at his Savior. He sees his face. He hears his words once again. Come, for it is I. And he knows that he can trust in him. 
So he climbs out of the boat and puts both feet on the water and his feet are secure. And he starts to walk towards Jesus. We have, we have to take a step of faith. When we take a step of faith, we experience the power of God. Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and simply asked Jesus if he could join him. Jesus said one word to Peter, come. In that one word, Jesus was saying, trust me, have faith. Just leave the comfort of your boat and just step out on the water. There's a common theme in the Bible, and that is to get out of your comfort zone and to step out in faith. In Exodus chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4, I'm going to turn there in my Bible. Exodus chapter 4, um, verses 3 and 4, it says, and this is where um, uh, Moses is performing a miraculous sign for Pharaoh. Verse 3, it says, and he said, cast it on the ground, meaning his staff. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it up, and it became a rod in his hand. There Moses saw a poisonous snake hissing on the ground. And God said, you want to experience the power of God? Pick it up. Have faith. And in faith, Moses picked up the snake by the tail, and the snake became a staff once again. The children of Israel, running from Pharaoh's army, came to the Red Sea. They were trapped. And in Exodus chapter 14, God said to come in, to walk into the water. They had to take that risky step of faith and march between the waters. 40 years later, the, or excuse me, 40 years, the children of Israel were on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And God said in Joshua chapter 3 to come in and to take this land. But they had to take up, but they had to take a step of faith. And when they entered the water, the waters backed up for miles while they crossed on dry ground. Those are just a few stories, and there are many more in the Bible, and they all have one thing in common. When God said to come, people took a step of faith to experience God's power. Stepping out in faith requires you to do an action. Through faith and trust, we'll no longer doubt God's ability or question that if this is the right path, for your life. Believe that God will meet you each step of the way and use you to do great and mighty things, and he will. Stepping out in faith sometimes means, it means leaving your comfort zone. Abraham stayed in a foreign land of promise. Staying intense, yet he remained faithful to his mission. When God calls you, you might be asked to leave behind your family a romantic relationship, a church, a job, a house, whatever it may be. But in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You can't play it safe and stay in your comfort zone while still following Jesus. It won't always be easy. You may hit bumps along the way, but God will give you the endurance to push forward. Of course, God does always keep his promises, and God is patiently waiting for you to take that first step. When you do, he'll be right there to guide you and direct you through the journey. So what about your story? What step of faith do you need to take this evening? What secure building are you still resting one foot on? What's the comfort zone you need to leave behind to take that first step of faith? 
Maybe it's stepping away from a, from a relationship that you know is wrong. Perhaps you have an opportunity to help someone, to befriend someone, to serve God in a way that you never imagined serving God before. Maybe it's trusting God with your finances completely. You feel God urging you this evening to take that first step. And it's scary. It might take away time from your independence and fun. It could affect your popularity or status. Maybe you've never taken that step of faith to begin a relationship with God before. It's quite simple. God asks us to stop doing things our way and to put our trust in him, to ask him to be in control of our lives. Putting our trust in him, having faith isn't God, you can have this, but then continuing to worry about it. Having faith is giving it to God and then not stressing over it. It's jumping out of the boat with both feet confidently that you'll be on top of the water when you hit it. Because you know that you've given it all to him. The ironic fact is that even though it looks as if we're stepping away from something solid onto a thin wire, faith in God is actually stepping from shaky ground to a solid foundation. But it starts with a step out of our comfort zone. It, step, it starts with a step of faith, giving it to God. As I close this evening with prayer, I want you to think about this. Taking the step of faith because it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do in your life by his power, not yours. And I want to invite you to take that step of faith, to give it all to God, to ask God to take all your worries, all your concerns, all your burdens away. And when he does, don't try to continue to grab a hold of them, but walk away from them confidently, knowing that God has them. And so this evening, I just want to invite you to have faith, to walk on the water, to keep your eyes fixed on the Savior. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads this evening with me. Dearly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for the stories in scripture that give us hope. We know that people weren't always perfect, but when they did trust you, amazing things happened. Lord, I ask that this evening that you would help us to trust you, to have faith, to give it all over to you, to give our lives to you, to not try to worry about what's going to happen but to know that you're in control. Lord, I want to thank you for what you're doing, what you will do in our lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining me, uh, joining us this evening, and we hope that you have a wonderful and happy Sabbath. Thank you so much, Pastor Mosselman. Thank you. May God bless your ministry. That was a powerful message. I would like to pray for you right now and your ministry as we begin the Sabbath also to say thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath. And then I'll see the rest of you tomorrow night at 730 with Pastor Christopher Lockhart as we continue in our Faith Time series. And I'll leave you with this song as well that talks about faith that you all like. And it has become our some sort of theme song this week. So let me pray. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Bless Pastor Mosselman and his ministry. Bless his wife. Protect him with holy angels and let your spirit always and your presence go before him so he can bless others in his district. Praying that this Sabbath will be a productive one and an enjoyable one for all of us. As we pray in Jesus' holy name, amen. May God bless you. Have a good and blessed rest of the evening and go ahead and share it with your family as you receive the Sabbath together.
there is peace in Christ when we walk with Him through the streets of Galilee to Jerusalem. Men, the broken hearts dry the tear filled eyes when we live the way He lived. There is peace in Christ. He gives us hope. A shelter in the storms of life when there's no peace on earth, there is peace in Christ. There's no peace on earth, there's peace in Christ.